state of emergency and the dumbest bill in America. This is Mark Fisher with Mark and the Millennials. And the Millennial joining me today is Sam Fisher. We also have Delegate Warren Miller from the Maryland House of Delegates. And of course, Christopher Hopkins, our assistant producer, and Adam Katora, our producer. So, state of emergency. The President of the United States did something unprecedented in American history. There's a pandemic, and he has stated that there is a state of emergency and basically trying to get everybody to stay home, work from home, not go out in large uh, public gatherings, uh, and watch your health and make sure that you wash your hands constantly. This is unprecedented. And we're going to talk about this during this podcast. We're also going to talk about the pandemic itself and how the national, me national media has gone absolutely crazy over this pandemic to try to undermine his presidency and undermine his ability to win in a re-election in November. So first up, I wanna hear what you guys have to think about this pandemic and what do you think about the national state of emergency and where are we today? Warren. So uh, I wanted to get to the origins of the pandemic because there's competing stories out there about how this happened. And the first one that came to light was in China, there are meat markets with exotic animals. Um, they're not in sanitary conditions. And that's in Wuhan, China. All over China. All over but China. Okay. All over China. Uh, if you want zebra, you can go buy zebra. If you want giraffe, you can buy giraffe. Anything and the, and, that's exotic. And, and they eat these things. And they eat these things. Ugh. They're a delicacy. Ugh. And they could be in a state of decomposition, whatever it is, they're buying it and eating it. Ugh. And so the original storyline went that one of these animals was sick, human ate the, the meat, and there was a virus transfer. That was the original uh, storyline. Mm -hmm. Since that time, the Chinese government, through propaganda, has said that this was a result of the U.S. military releasing this virus. They're blaming they're, the United States of America exactly. for they're the virus. They're trying to blame us for genetically create or biomedically creating this virus and releasing it in China, and saying patient one is somewhere in the U.S. Oh, so that way we could that way we could actually poison ourselves. That's why we did exactly That's unbelievable. So the more plausible thing that came out recently is in Wuhan, China, there is a stage four biomedical research facility. So this is mm -hmm. the stuff where the creep all the creepy germs and viruses go things like smallpox, anthrax. Right. So the employees there have been caught in the past because they use these things on animals to test vaccines or to okay. test antibiotics, but they may also be biomedically engineering these viruses or diseases for their own whatever use. Yes, military use probably. But the story goes these lab workers aren't very well paid and they will take the animals after they've been tested and they will sell them to these street markets. Oh, gross. So that's a new storyline about how this meat, this infected meat may Which have gotten into this market. And certainly something, believable. Something out of a Chinese government run biomedical research facility, which they may or may not have been weaponizing. That's far more plausible than the other things. Now, the last thing, if you're in a conspiracy theory, so yes, I have a let's question hear the conspiracy for your, theory. your listeners, because I've one. thought about this. <laughs> if you look at the Hopkins map of where the coronavirus Johns Hopkins, is. Johns Hopkins of Baltimore, Maryland. Yep. There are some noticeable areas where it's not, and one of the most notable is Russia. If you look at the map, either the government is vastly underreporting it, or there's some type of a vaccine or some program in Russia where the, the citizens just aren't being impacted by it, like in Iran and other places. So Meaning my, that maybe they have a vaccine in Russia. Right. If it actually originated in, in uh, Russia, they also had a vaccine organized or, you know, obviously produced right. well in advance to make sure. So my conspiracy theory is if this was, if this is state terrorism, this is Russia has All put over this it. in China. It's Russia! It's Russia. <laughs> So if you're a Democrat and you hate Russia, this plays right into your... Well, then it would have to be Trump and Russia if it's Russia, right? Because Well, we're getting in trouble because of the virus. I mean, part of your show, we're going to talk about how the president is just the Katrina moment. This is, this. is The Democrats are using this as a political weapon. This is COVID-19 as political warfare. What I think is interesting is that the media has not once asked the president at any press conference, do you think this is man-made? this particular virus, man-made intentionally for the purpose of its release to kill people or to make people sick. Do you think this is man-made? I haven't heard the press ask that, which makes me wonder if potentially it is indeed man-made and the national security folks are asking the press not to ask the question so the president doesn't yet have to answer it and create more panic than perhaps there already may be. What do you think about that, Sam? And this is Sam, he's the millennial, so it's, <laughs> 
It's Sam and the Boomers. <laughs> Usually Garrick and the Boomers. What do you think about that? If it's man-made, I mean, I think anyone saying with 100% certainty where they know the virus is coming from is completely wrong. I think it's healthy to have a, a sense of skepticism. Skepticism, and, is, skepticism is good. And I, although it's a conspiracy theory, I think it's a completely validated one uh, in the sense that Russia is trying to create as much division between China and the U.S. as much as possible. Uh, so I think it's completely valid uh, that it, it, it could be potentially man-made. And if this is the future of warfare, this is incredibly scary. Um, I mean, if we look at World War I and just see how warfare has progressed, first it was gas. Gas was completely removed away from warfare after World War II because it was such a deadly thing. I could imagine if biological warfare uh, was instituted in the, in the near future here. Yeah, and allegedly that's not something good, Warren. Yeah. Just one thing I want to jump in on here that I forgot to mention. So now that we've gotten this out of the way, the, the conspiracy theory about Russia. Yeah. Last week, Russia and OPEC got in a little fight over oil prices. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to see gasoline prices plummet in the U.S. Absolutely. They're going to go well below $2 a gallon. It's one good thing. For the uh, consumer. Well, it's, for the consumer. it's a bad thing for the American um, gas and oil, oil industry. In it, gas yes. and oil industry. There are a lot of loans. These are fledgling industries. And this is Russia and OPEC's attempt by feigning a fight to destroy our fledgling energy independence. Interesting. They want us dependent on the Saudi oil, the Russian mm -hmm. oil, whatever it is. And they'll do anything to hurt us economically. So isn't it convenient that we have a conspiracy theory about a virus and at the same time, we're having to deal with economic warfare. It is. There is absolutely economic warfare um, that's going on. Uh, the, I mean, let's face it. The economy has completely and utterly shut down, without question. If you, if you can't go to work because you're told, you know, your, your company is closed, we want you to work from home, and you happen to be on the digital side of the economy, you're probably going to be okay because you can work from home. But if you're on the services end of the economy and your employer is saying, don't come to work, you're in big trouble because I don't know how the employer is going to pay you. I don't know how you're going to be able to make a living and pay your bills. And this is really dangerous stuff, which is why it makes me wonder, uh, you know, I'm not by nature a cons somebody who believes in conspiracy theories, but I'm also, I also am a critical thinker and say to myself, why is this virus only attacking the weak and the elderly primarily? Primarily, why is it deadly to them? And it's also deadly to young people, but who only those young people, for the most part, who also have immune systems that are compromised. And I, to me, that's a fascinating thing because it's almost like a call the herd kind of biological weapon, which is also extremely odd and weird. Um, I'm hoping that I'm wrong on all these accounts because if mm -hmm. I'm wrong, then we can move forward, we can fix this, we can come up with a vaccine. Um, as a country and also, you know, as a planet to help, you know, create a solution to the problem. Um, but on the other hand, I still think we're going to have this happen again and again mm -hmm. uh, because of the fact that China doesn't clearly doesn't have a handle on what's happening in these markets. And they have a healthcare system that's state run. And uh, by the way, what's happening in China? Anyone know? I mean, it's like radio silence. I mean, what is happening in China? They, uh, they reported on Friday that they had 11 new cases and 13 new deaths, and that things are going, Impossible. Impossible I, you have they a have that view. You have a society of 1.4 billion people. There's no way that's plausible whatsoever. Additionally, Apple stores close stores worldwide, and they were already closed in China. They're actually starting to reopen them in China because they're trying to show that things are getting better, fine. everything yeah. is completely fine. Things, If you look at Iran, things are not fine worldwide and China. It's not possible at all. So one more interesting point after what you just said, Mark. Um, people are in a sheer panic about coronavirus. No yeah. doubt. And rightly so. They don't know what's going to happen. It's an unknown. Mm -hmm. But this year alone in America, in the USA, twenty to 50,000 people will die from flu. The flu vaccine is 10% effective against flu strains this year. Which is awful. So... We, we already deal with this on an annual basis. We have yes. something called the flu, and we have other, you got pneumonia, you got a whole rash of things that are endemic. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, the unknown is how do we fight it? How do we deal with it? But it, the end result of this, regardless of the number of fatalities, which are going to be horrible, is we'll be better prepared the next time something like this that happens. That is hopefully. definitely, yeah. that's well said. That is definitely the good news. And and look, here's here's why I think people are panicking. Uh, on the one, because we have in Iran, there are uh, cor cor coronavirus burial pits that have been seen from satellite images. 
and they're massive burial pits the size of football fields, one after another after another. And that means that clearly many thousands of people have died. And when you view these burial pits, it's you see white on top because that's how much lime they've put, to be, for a satellite to be able to see that, first of all, the actual white of the lime shows you how awful it must be. And I think it's in the city of Qom, yep. which where they're having most of the issues. But here, here's an example of a, a country that was a once great civilization and they, they're run by religious zealots and all they do is export terrorism and I find it interesting and sad for the people of Iran that their government has hijacked you know, that once great civilization and turned them away from, from you know, Western society and turned them away from science, uh, which is incredible. And now we see what's happening. And I think that when you read this in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and other news outlets about what's happening in Iran, you say to yourself, wow, I mean, they were obviously overwhelmed their healthcare system was such as it is, because I'm sure it's not a very good one, but it also happened in Italy, Italy. I mean, here's a Western country. And what's happening in Italy? Anybody, anybody want to talk about that? So, or go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, first I'd like to talk about Iran. And sure. before I go into that, it just makes us thankful that one, as a society, we're overcautious, we're innovative, we're transparent, and we're already economically thriving, where we could properly prepare for an incident like this. Contrast that with Iran, right now they have 14,000 infected and 724 deaths. Because as a nation, I don't think they're as transparent. It could be potentially way oh, we, more than it's that. It's clearly in the thousands. However, dead. back in February, they were faced with the dilemma of their leaders could say, let's keep the economy open, let's keep things the status quo, or let's have a national quarantine and actually lock things up. Because of U.S. sanctions, they were incredibly worried that with an already poor economy, that their, um, that, that their population would protest and revolt against the government. So they decided to keep the economy open, which has led to this mass spread of the disease. And not only that, they don't have the healthcare system that we do. Their economy is not as diversified as we are. They're completely relying on oil. Their main customer is essentially being China, who has less demand for oil right now because of the crisis. Great so, point. Uh, essentially, it just makes you thankful for, for the situation that we're in and that we are overcautious. And you know what they lack yeah. the most of all, Iran? Transparency. Exactly. I'm sure people didn't even know why others were getting sick. Um, and because, as you know, Iran blocks access to the internet, yep. just like China does, to be able to stop transparency and accountability. And that's, you know, that's what these kinds of author authoritarian societies, communist societies, you know, dictator, I mean, that's what these kinds of places do. And that's why um, transparency is so important. What do you think about Italy, Warren? So, and, and I, sorry if I'm going to step on your line. Oh, no problem. The thing about Italy, uh, Americans, you know, people around the world love Italian leather goods. <laughs> <laughs> well, several years ago, um, most of these companies that make this Italian leather sold out to Chinese companies. Oh. And they have imported, I forget if the number is 10,000 or 100,000 Chinese workers to, to actually, make them to in make Italy. The leather goods in northern Italy. And so the epicenter for the virus in Italy was, was because the Chinese were there in droves. They brought it with them. They quickly became infected, and it spread in Italy. Unbelievable. Um, so, and same thing in Iran. There's a group of uh, Muslim dissidents in China named the Uyghurs. Mm -hmm. And there's a large population of Uyghurs that are in Iran. So the focal point for that was the Uyghurs brought it into Iran, um, and it spread from there. So in each of these cases, you can track major reasons why it hit those areas first. And one of the interesting thing about the Uyghurs is they have been in internment camps and re-education camps in China now for quite some time. And one of the things that the Chinese Communist government is doing right now in China is pulling those Uyghurs out of those internment camps and putting them back to work in the factories, uh, almost like you know, an experimentation to find out if, you know, the virus is still prevalent and so forth, which I'm, of course, sure it is in China. Um, but mm -hmm. they've also used the Uyghurs, as you well know, they've also used them for um, uh, basically their organs, harvesting organs oh, of God. people that there's nothing. I mean, this is, this, is, this is communism. And this is why we have Mark and the Millennials, because we want the Millennials <laughs> to, to understand that the world is a dangerous place. What's another name yeah. for communism, Mark? 
<laughs> Stalinist. No, let's try again. Another word. Marxism, Leninism. Another word. Uh, socialism. Banning? Socialism. Okay, I thought you were saying Which banning. we have a candidate running for president who is a socialist. Well, I think they're all socialists, really, these days. I mean, but I agree with you. One is openly talking about socialism because he is, <laughs> and the other is right. The others are talking about the same policies but saying they're not socialists. So get, get this. We have multiple kinds of responses from the people of the United States, uh, particularly the media. We're going to go to that in a minute. But first, believe it or not, California Democrat Gavin Newsom praises President Trump's response to the coronavirus on cruise ships, the cruise ship outbreak in California. And, you know, the Trump administration responded because obviously Gavin Newsom requested the assistance of the federal government. And Gavin Newsom, of all people, of all people, said he, he praised Donald Trump. I mean, this is unheard of. A California Democrat, you know, a woke Democrat. We have a clip on this. You have to hear it to believe it. And here it is. I, before he made those statements publicly, I had a private conversation with him around 4.30 uh, West Coast time. Uh, and he said everything uh, that I could have hoped for. Uh, and we had a very long conversation. Uh, and every single thing he said, they followed through on. So I'm, I'm just not interested in and finding daylight uh, on those statements because uh, every single thing, his administration, and it starts at the top, uh, including the vice president, uh, has been consistent with uh, the expectation that we repatriate these passengers and we do it in a way that does justice to the spirit that defines the best of our country and the state of California. So there's Gavin Newsom. Can you believe that? Can you believe I'm in shock. It? Wow. I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a California Democrat says the president, I mean, right now they're probably trying to find out ways to unelect Gav, Gavin Newsom in, uh, in California for actually saying nice things about Donald Trump. <laughs> and of course, then we have to, we have to go to the media and, and also to the private sector, a, a tech think tank chief. Does anyone know how to say this guy's na last name? Sizoka? Um, I think that's how you say his last name. It's S-Z-O-K-A. He's a tech think tank chief. And based in Washington, D.C., he, he uh, basically tweeted a, uh, a death tweet, if you will, for Trump, saying, you know, basically, serious question, as he says, could there possibly be any greater poetic justice in the universe than for Donald Trump to die of a CPAC virus? That's what he tweeted. Shortly thereafter, he was let go as the head of this, uh, tech, uh, this tech think tank, as he should have been. Um, but this is the craziness, right? These are people who try to take advantage. Good for Gavin Newsom. We've got to give a Democrat, whenever it's you know, whenever they're willing to 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 go above the fray, uh, uh, basically, main kudos to them for being you know able to, to 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 rise above all this stuff. But Bill Mayer, next up, Bill Bill Maher, excuse me, I would say Mayor, it's Mar, excuse Mar. me, uh, <laughs> says that he's hoping for a crashing economy so we can get rid of Trump. So now we're going to start all of the media craziness, and this is the first one up. We have a clip on this, and here's Mark. Can I ask about the economy? Because this economy is going pretty well. We have to, what? You're, why, why is that funny? Hey, it is going well for now. For now, right. That's my, thank you. That's my question. <laughs> is, like, the, I feel like the bottom has to fall out at some point. And by the way, I'm hoping for it, because I think one way you get rid of Trump is a crashing economy. Yeah. So please, bring on the recession. Yeah. Sorry if that hurts people, but it's either root for a recession or you lose your democracy. There you go, guys. Have at it. This guy is a moron, and he's the reason <laughs> I don't subscribe to HBO. <laughs> I won't give him a cent because of this guy. He is the most outspoken bully that you can find anywhere. Um, he abuses everybody equally, but he's right up there with people like uh, in the old days in the D.C. region, there was somebody named the Grease Man on the radio. I remember he the Grease Man. He lost his job. And if he was any bit less liberal than he is, he wouldn't have a job right now. Absolutely. Um, he has a right to free speech, but his, his use of it is just abhorrent. It is. Go ahead, Sam. I know you like. You actually, you're a millennial, and you actually like Mar. I do. Yeah. Real quick on on Gavin Newsom. It's nice to see a, a bipartisan detente, at least for for, yeah, for a couple for, of weeks. Even even uh, for the California in a, in a Democrat. situation of crisis, and and for for the uh, tech guy, I thought one thing that was interesting as well is not only did he say he wished the virus would infect Trump, he said he wished the CPAC virus would infect Trump. Exactly. So in some twi twisted fantasy, he hopes that. 
there is some level of irony that a conservative would inflict the virus on Trump and that he would die. And that's so. probably everybody at CPAC <laughs> would too as well, which is disgusting. But by the way, that's what Mars is saying as well, because by definition, if you're saying that you want there to be a recession and you want their, you know, the economy to crash, then aren't you also saying that you want that by definition people are going to be dying as well? I mean, that's sick. Yeah, well, I do find Bill Maher funny, and I do think that we need more comedians who are the anti-political woke to, to win back the culture and stand up, which Maher actually does consistently, along with Bill Burr and Dave Chappelle. Uh, From time how, to time he does, yeah. I, I think Chappelle so. Chappelle for sure. I, I think he does. And however, I, I will say this comment was completely out of bounds. I mean, he has a net worth of $100 million. He's not going to be impacted by the recession whatsoever. Good point. And additionally, all the people that lose their jobs, obviously potentially lose their health care and other services. I, this is completely lack it of is. respect. It is. This is this is something we're hearing at every level. There's there's hope amongst Democrats. They're supposed to be the party of the working people, the service industry, the unions, all these things. Uh, we're hoping doom and gloom on the economy to hurt the president. And I can't think of a bigger reason that their base should just throw them all out. I mean, how do you get to a point where you used to be the guy that supported the working man, and now you're hoping for a recession? You're hoping that people get economically sick. harmed. It's yeah. sick. It's just, it's, it's indefensible. And not to be outdone, CNN's Don Lemon interviews former Ohio <laughs> Governor John Kasich about Trump's comments about the corona- coronavirus. I have a hard time saying that word, coronavirus, because I keep wanting to saying I keep wanting to say corona beer. <laughs> but won't let Kasich answer any questions. We actually have two clips on this. This is a CNN, you know, far left crazy person who's supposed to be a reporter, a journalist, and he's interviewing John Kasich, and he won't even let him answer. And so we have here's the first of two clips. Here it is. Times, and I just got to say, if the president came I, out to uh, calm okay. people's fears. He didn't do a good job of it because they've had to come back and clarify it several times. And if this has been going on long enough for them to get it straight, we need straight, accurate information from this president and this administration. And we're not getting it. And I don't understand why you are tiptoeing around it. He came out, gave an address that that usually that happens very rarely, and he doesn't get it right. So Don Lemon wouldn't let Kasich answer the question. Kasich, keeps, he keeps trying to break in to say, well, can I respond to your question? And so, I mean, once again, I mean, that's the media now. That's CNN and MSNBC. What do you think about this? I mean, it's... The media left news a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all about your, your, your feelings and your emotions and your political point of view. And the people News who watch it. News is nowhere it. wrapped up in any of that. Who are the people that watch this guy, Don Lemon? Not that, many. That, that the they, ratings are horrible. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. How, how is Don Lemon still considered a journalist on CNN? Well, Lily, <laughs> <laughs> all, all, essentially his show is political commentary. It is. It's, it's complete it's, political commentary. It's consistently all opinion. I, I just don't get it. So finally, Lemon lets Kasich kind of respond, and then, of course knocks them off right again all over. We have that, uh, you just can't believe this. Here's the second clip of this interview. Here it is. I'm going to tell you, first of all, he read it. And somebody that wrote this, look, I don't want to get into that. He went, was well, on not. today. That's why you're here, tonight, to talk was, about he, the president's can I, address. Can I finish now? No, but, let no, me no, talk. no, 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 you let can't, John. John, because we're here to talk oh, about I the president's talk. address. Wait, we're here. I don't, want you to, I don't want you to go on and deflect and talk about something else because we're here to talk about the president's address. And, and you said that someone else wrote it. He's the president. Even if someone Look, else he, wrote it, it should be right. I know right. he did. And he has to be, res- Don, Don, he put, the, he put this thing out because there was some confusion out there, okay? This now is there's a more very confusion, John. He doesn't want an answer. I mean, there is Lemon, the same interview. That's the second clip. He just doesn't want an answer. He keeps asking questions. And then as soon as Kasich tries to give an answer, Lemon basically interrupts him and then asks them another question. So you, there, it's an impossible way to actually have any kind of dialogue. I mean, it's cancel culture in real time. That's well said. <laughs> oh, my God. Millennial. Home run for the millennial. Cancel cu- That's basically MSNBC, I mean, but certainly that's his show. And another thing I, I really didn't like about it is the point of having a Republican on the show is to obviously defend Donald Trump. And instead of actually having a defender of Donald Trump, you have John Kasich, who is a never-Trumper. And the end goal is to create a narrative that both Republicans and Democrats were not a fan of the Trump response to the coronavirus. Uh, so it's, it's pretty sick uh, that they're essentially just trying to create this, this hysteria around, around coronavirus. Absolutely. That's exactly response. right.
And so we have MSNBC's Nicole Wallace and Eddie Glaude Jr. discuss the coronavirus as Trump's Katrina. So the media continues the meltdown, and here's this clip. But I was thinking about this in terms of politics, right? Uh, we talked about uh, the business community finally not kind of sticking with Donald Trump. But this may be, and I, you know, Nicole, I should mention this with little trepidation, but this may be Donald Trump's Katrina. Yeah, you kind of have to have trepidation because <laughs> but, of my role in that. I mean, but, I, let, let, let's just lean into that for yeah. a minute. I mean, Katrina was the moment when all of the things that felt incredibly incompetent about the Bush presidency, the appointment of Harriet Myers to the Supreme Court, the botched attempt to pass Social Security privatization. I mean, I, I lived it. I can go through the whole list were realized. We gave them a proof point that we were indeed incompetent. And also people died. I mean, this is this has the making structurally for the same kind of moment. For and if there's Trump. any a moment that would shake that 40 percent, the folks who would allow him to shoot someone and ride down, for the, mm. if there's any a moment, it's this one. Because it's babies, it's friends, it's loved it's ones. It's old people it's in nursing homes home, that can't have their parents. daughters and sons it's and your nana. So uh, you, you have to, so guys, you heard this, right? Out there in podcast land, what you have to understand is Nicole Wallace is actually smiling. She's mm-hmm. really gleeful. She's happy that this is happening. They're, they're so excited at MSNBC that people are dying and that people are getting sick because all they care about in their mental illness, they are, they're mentally ill, is that Donald Trump doesn't get reelected. And to me, there's something wrong with these people. Warren. So these people are hyper-partisan. They're Democrats. They're liberal Democrats. Um, They would put the destruction of our country and our values over what we have. And uh, again, it's inexcusable. It's right up there with Bill Maher. Um, And I guarantee you, for eight years under Barack Obama, everything was great. (laughs) Yes, all the stuff that we're revealing about how our government institutions haven't been working for so long, and they've been working, you know, against us in many cases, um, and against the American people, particularly the the, de- the deplorables, the people who have been left behind. Um, and we're actually, and here's the thing: I want to segue into this because you heard you've heard how crazy the media has gotten, and China uh, has hinted that they are willing to potentially deny Americans life-saving drugs. Why is that? Well, because guess what? We have exported much of our pharmaceutical manufacturing to China. We have exported much of our medical device products to China. And why have we done that? Why? It's just a continuation of all of the other industries that we've systematically exported to China. And except now we realize, Well, gee, why did we do that? Well, guess what, folks? Who is it? Who is the first president in American history since Richard Nixon, who opened up China and and started the conversation for trade and for dialogue, who's the first president in American history to actually start questioning that relationship and the exporting of American jobs? Donald Trump. And now here we have this pandemic and we're realizing, guess what? They control a lot of our industries. These, these may be American companies. These may be European companies, but they're not making it here. So we can't even get it. What do you guys think? So uh, we've talked about this. If you watch Shark Tank, there's always the thing about, you know, what's your margin? What do you make when you, what do you pay to have this product made? What do you make? And somebody will say, oh, it cost me $5 to make it and I sell it for 15 And the answer always is from one of the sharks that, oh, your production costs are too high. Yep. And typically it's because they have the neighbor down the street that is making whatever it is they're trying to sell. Mm -hmm. So it's an American job. So the answer is, uh, well, you should, you should look to China because it's, you know, they can do it for two fifty instead of the $5. And that's been the mentality. And this is where people have to be careful because greed kills capitalism. Yes, it does. And so if, if, you know, this made in America thing, if, if it's somebody down the street gets a job because of something you're doing, you're helping the American economy, and we can all succeed. But when you start to put your profit margin over uh, American jobs and American production, you start to have things like China. And now, here we are, yes. pandemic, l- looking in the face of recession, things are going bad, uh, Russians and the OPEC trying to get rid of our oil, um, and what's happening? So and now, yeah, so, so we're now we're setting ourselves saying, up for economic blackmail. Is international trade, you know, in, there are benefits of international trade, but when you export critical industries abroad, 
you export the manufacturing abroad of critical industries, you're in big trouble when there's a problem such as, I don't know, a pandemic. Or if you export the steel industry and you now go to, then you have to go to war, well, someone else, maybe your enemy is making the steel. It's just stupid. It's really stupid. I mean, you really put that well, Warren. I mean, I think that it's interesting. The Democrats are, they, they continue to raise the minimum wage, which makes, which makes it harder to make, to make products here. But at the same time, we have Democrats and Republicans alike who have been in cahoots with major American corporations to outsource some of the most important industries to mankind and to our society, to China of all places. And if there were ever an example of what we shouldn't be doing, it's exporting life-saving drugs during a pandemic. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think millennials, and this, this includes myself, were completely wrong when it came to free trade. We take advantage of because you all were taught free trade is the bomb. Yeah, it's all yeah. It's, it's the best thing ever. Absolutely, we took advantage of cheap products. We have Amazon. It's incredibly convenient, and essentially, it's completely bit us in the butt. And uh, with this pandemic, uh, go ahead, Warren. Sorry. Well, and just to answer that, um, I was taught. I mean, I worked for President Reagan. I was taught yep. free trade was the absolute best thing. Mm -hmm. But free trade only works if it's truly free, free trade. Yeah. And the problem we have is not that free trade has failed us. The problem we have is we've let other countries game what they call free trade. Mm -hmm. So you have the Chinese through money manipulation, stock manipulation, um, through using government assets to control industries. Dumping, dumping. Dumping. I mean, there's a whole range of things they do. And we thought we were entering into free trade agreements with them. And as the president's been going through all these agreements and changing them, now we're, we're going to be in a position where either countries will freely trade with us and not try to manipulate this, or we're just not going to trade with them anymore. And I, I think one of the major issues, well, was not just free trade, but how we put all of our eggs in one basket. I think, what was it, 97% of antibiotics are produced in China. Like, if you go to a financial advisor, they don't tell you to put all of your e eggs in one basket. You diversify your portfolio. And Marco, Why can't we diversify sorry. your supply chains? And by the way, Marco yeah. Rubio, great point. Marco Rubio was interviewed about this very issue. We have a clip on this, and, and here, is, here is proof uh, that this is indeed the case because we've seen it in the journal, Wall Street Journal. We've seen it in other news media out outlets. And thankfully, the media is finally asking United States senators and leaders at the highest levels of our national government what's going on about this and why. And here is the clip. Complete number. Here's what we do know. About 80% of the active ingredients, you know, the different components of a drug, about 80% of those come from abroad, and the overwhelming majority of that 80% are manufactured in China. So the drug may ultimately be assembled here, but all the components of it, we rely on China for it. So just as an example, a few years ago, there was an explosion at a laboratory in China, and it disrupted the global supply of certain antibiotics. So these are not just COVID-19, you know, coronavirus drugs we're talking about here. We're talking about things people use on a daily basis, especially generics. And that is because we allowed offshoring. For years, we know the market basically said, well, it's cheaper to make it over there. Let's make it over there. It's more profitable for the companies. So not only did we lose those jobs in the United States, we lost this capacity. And now we don't know if there are going to be shortages. We anticipate there will be in certain drugs because those factories have been shut down because of the virus. Yes, yeah, so the factories are shut down in China for obvious reasons, because they, you know, the pandemic started there and it's a country of 1.4 billion people. And we're gonna have shortages in the United States because the idiot pharmaceutical companies and the idiots who were running our national government for decades were in cahoots with them to say, oh yeah, that's fine. Let's not produce, let's not produce the products here. By the way, these are probably really high paying jobs. Let's, but in spite of that, let's let's send it over to China because you know we can make it cheaper. Your Shark Tank example, Warren, was terrific. I mean, I can't think of a better example than that. I mean, final thoughts on this because this is probably to me the central learning point, the teaching moment of this pandemic. This is the teaching moment. I think the scariest thing too. Let's say worst case scenario that sixty percent, seventy percent of the world is inflicted with the coronavirus, and ninety plus percent of antibiotics are produced in China. Who are they going to give the antibiotics first? Of course, their own people. Yes, and certainly the leadership. And their leadership. All the, all the party apparatchiks are going to get it first. And with 1.4 billion people, I mean, and I agree with you. And their closest allies, which may be not be us in the near future. We'll, we'll see. Well, <laughs> one thing's for sure. We have a president that will do something about this. Yes, and the will. whole reason to reelect Donald Trump is, you better bet in the next three or four years, there will be factories in the U.S. Absolutely. And there will be jobs centered around bringing this capability back.
Thank goodness. And he believes in national resiliency. He's somebody that will work tirelessly to get this done. Uh, my hope is we take the house back and we have the ability to do a lot of these things to set us up to last for the next century. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. It's, it's, what, it's what has to happen. What's the economic impact uh, on the, the final thoughts of the coronavirus before we go to the to uh, some funny stuff and the dumbest bill in America, what is gonna be the economic impact on the United States for the coronavirus? I mean, what do you guys think? Uh, I mean, uh, the, for one, the President of the United States is talking about a stimulus, which, is, which tells you how bad things are going to get. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, Warren? I think it's gonna be pretty bad for a while. It's just, a, it's a question of, and we've talked about this, the, the virus, how long it gets spread out when the peak occurs, yes. right? So the Chinese want us to believe they're it's already peaked and they're on the back side of it. That may or may not be reality. But in our case, we have to hope that because of the measures that have been taken, the federal level and the state level and the quarantines and all those things, we've slowed down the pace of spread of the virus. And as we start to have these deaths, as we've seen, they're paced out so that our first responders can deal with them adequately. We're buying time. Uh, we're buying time. And if that works, we may not see uh, as much economic damage as if this thing peaks all at once and we start to be like Italy or Iran. And we just shut and down. And we have to pray that doesn't happen. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Sam, thoughts on the, thoughts on what the economic impact of the coronavirus will be on the US? I, I know we talk about this a lot and you say that in order to be a country, you have to manufacture and produce things. Absolutely. But, however, I, I'm very fortunate that we're a digital, we're a service economy at this point because many of its people can still work from home. Obviously ours is, relied on services. So I don't think the, inc the economic impact will be as bad, say, as within Italy or UK or China. Because but we have such a strong digital economy, but clearly- It's a, it's a diversified the economy The services as part well. of our economy is massive. And that's what my concern is. But no, I hear you. I mean, it's a diversified economy. That's my point. So I don't think the ec economic impact will be as bad. Good stuff. So SNL, Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Live does a segment on Laura Ingram and the Ingram <laughs> angle and and- of all people, Laura Ingram interviews Chris Matthews. Well, of course, these are two SNL actors. Uh, <laughs> these aren't the actual people on TV, but they're making fun of Chris Matthews, who was recently fired from his day job. And uh, Laura Ingram, of course, making fun of her, you know, right-wingness on Fox News. And we have the clip, funny stuff, here it is. Welcome back to Harbaugh, I'm Chris Matthews. Tonight, my guest is Laura, a spooky blonde lady who lies to the elderly. Ha! <laughs> Chris, no, you're on my show. Oh, I forgot. Force of habit. Maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this. You look great. Chris, you can say whatever you want. It's Fox. Oh, my God. This place, <laughs> the place is amazing. Everyone here is hot, crazy, or both. Yeah. Now, you resigned after recent non-scandals, like comparing Bernie Sanders to Hitler. How do you respond? And remember, you can put it as crazy as you want to. All right, here it goes. The race is down to Hitler and an ice cream cone to see who can beat the Michelin man. <coughs> Back to you, girl, Hitler. <laughs> Welcome home. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Good stuff. So my question mark is, I know who Hitler is, is uh, who he's identifying, but which one's the Michelin man and which one's the ice cream cone? I think, I think they're talking about Trump as the Michelin man, but I'm not sure. No, I would think he's referring to Trump as Hitler. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, so probably it's, so. It's, it's Bernie and Biden. It's just which one's the ice cream and which one's the Michelin <laughs> man. And I'm not sure I understand the... the, the that flew over my head. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it did, did for me too, but still funny stuff because, you know, obviously Chris Matthews uh, was always, I thought, half crazy uh, because it, for no other reason, not just from what he said, but the way he talks. And this wasn't really Chris Matthews, by the way, for those we said that already, but it's important. This was an SNL skit. It was satire <laughs> uh, making fun of Laura Ingram and Chris Matthews, but good for them. Good for them. Do, do millennials even watch SNL? We do. And- First of all, this is really kicking a person while they're down with Chris Matthews, but I think this is when <laughs> SNL's at its... <laughs> I love it. I love it. Come on. I, I think this is SNL at its finest where they're making fun of both sides, where you can laugh at yourself and you can laugh at the other side as well. Absolutely. But I, I don't think millennials watch SNL in the traditional format, in the, in the sense of actually watching on NBC. I think they're watching small clips, the best clips from YouTube. So it's still being 
popular view, just not in the traditional sense. Cool. Yeah. So next up, we have the dumbest bill in America. The dumbest bill in America. Do we have lead up? <laughs> the lead up. Here it goes. So wait a minute. What you're saying is that you want us to put water on the crops. Yes. Water. Like out the toilet? Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be out of the toilet, but, but yeah, that's the idea. But Brando's got what plants crave. It's got electrolytes. <laughs> <laughs> of course, one of the best clips ever from the movie Idiocracy. That is our lead up to the dumbest bill in America. And it is in Minneapolis. The city council of Minneapolis has banned, wait for it, banned drive throughs Like drive throughs at banks, drive throughs at fast food. Drive throughs at pharmacies. Well, gee, you know, coronavirus, you might get coronavirus, so you don't want to go in the CVS pharmacy or whatever pharmacy that you go to, so they have a drive through They want to ban them, and they have banned them. So moving forward, in the city of Minneapolis, you cannot build a new drive through The existing ones are grandfathered in. Oh, how nice are they to grandfather those in? <laughs> uh, and so, so, I'm sorry, these are stupid people. These incredibly stupid people. Warren, I want your thoughts on this banning trend of the woke Democrats of drive throughs So much for convenience. I mean, these, these things exist for a reason. You're on the go. You don't want to take the time to park, walk in. If you're elderly and you're picking up a prescription, you know, this is one less thing you can do. And you might catch a coronavirus while you're inside of the pharmacy, like you said. So Yeah, there's a reason. We have drive throughs It's just, it's, it's power drunk people pushing ridiculous ideas. And I think you were telling me some of this has to do with global warming. It does. Uh, yeah. the, the guy, so Lisa Bender, she's the city council president in Minneapolis. Her name is Lisa Bender for everybody out there. She's an idiot. Uh, complete progressive, crazy person. She said it's because of climate change because cars idle when they're in the line at the drive through and that idling contributes to climate change. It's like, well, how about if you have a Tesla? Does that not, I mean, you know, there might be a Tesla in line, so, but... Even, bes even beside that, who does she think she is to tell the private sector that they can't have a drive through I mean, go ahead. Millennials, I mean, are, please tell me millennials aren't on to, you know, I think Lisa Bender probably is a millennial, but I can't tell. I mean, I really hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell but, how old she is. She just looks crazy. I mean, they say this is a part of their uh, goal to reduce emissions by 50%, I think, by 2050. But they never say actually how much this reduce emissions by. They never actually give a quantifiable number to say how much it actually reduces by. I think the secondary reason they gave is they say it increases car crashes, drive throughs do, but they don't really give any data behind that as well. This is just taking control to another level, not only with sick people, but if you're a family with kids with disabilities, I mean, it's so much more of a convenience, obviously, it's to go through point. the drive through Drive through so. and, and, and a lot of, lot of times, these vans are equipped in such a way that the person with a dis disability, sometimes a very severe disability, can drive the van themselves. Exactly. And they can't, you know, it's much easier to go through the drive through That's a great point. out, exactly. I mean, it, the thing is, so look, we actually have a clip on this, but I have to set this clip up about, about the banning of drive throughs So there are two <laughs> Burger Kings in Minneapolis that were closed because the franchisor Burger King took them back because they weren't being run properly. So... Burger King had them boarded up and while they're trying to find a new franchise operator. So both Burger Kings remained boarded up. They both, of course, had drive throughs This law passed to ban drive throughs and Burger King's argument was, we should be grandfathered in. And the city council said, oh no, we banned that. You're not grandfathered in because you closed your Burger Kings. They said, yeah, but we still own the property or we're still leasing the property. We have these long-term leases. Still paying taxes on it. Still paying taxes on it. And so the media in Minneapolis went out to near where these Burger Kings are located and interviewed the locals who live there, primarily in, in African-American communities. Probably in food deserts. In food probably deserts. one of the only places they can get food. Probably so. Great point, Warren. And... And the media interviewed these folks, they're all African-American, and they were like, why? Why don't you open this? Back up. This is ridiculous. These, this drive through Ben. We have a clip on this. It's a, it's a little long. It's about a minute and 20 seconds. It's worth listening to. And here it is. The Burger King on West Broadway in North Minneapolis is boarded up, graffiti tagged with a raggedy tarp dangling from the marquee sign. Yeah, it would be nice to not see it boarded up. It's been this way for months. The restaurant closed more than a year ago. So do something with it. The same goes for the Burger King on Nicolette Avenue in South Minneapolis. It hurts the community because now you have an elephant sitting there hoping somebody come and invest in the property and say, okay, 
let's get this back going. Even though Burger King now wants to reopen the two locations with a new franchisee, the city of Minneapolis will not allow it because of the city's no drive through ordinance. All those in favor say aye. When the city council passed the ordinance in August, they grandfathered in restaurants like these Burger Kings that already had drive throughs But since the building sat empty for more than a year, the Zoning Board of Adjustment ruled they now will have to follow the new rules, leaving some people baffled. City need to be quiet, for real. They need to open that back up. Because of convenience, you have people with handicaps that don't want to get out their car, you know. I mean, cold weather like this in Minnesota. It is below zero. Some people, you know, you have kids in the car. So it, to me, is a very inconvenience. The city also heard from supporters of the ordinance who say the drive throughs create traffic dangers for pedestrians, noise, and pollution from idling cars. <gasps> oh my gosh, it creates pollution. Oh my gosh, and traffic. I mean, how awful. I mean, these people, I gotta tell you, these people, that run the Minneapolis, they're on the city council, and the president, Lisa Bender, you're crazy and shame on you. You'd rather have basically urban, you know, plight and, ur and, and urban blight, excuse me, and then you would actually help the people in, in these neighborhoods. And you heard, they're actually interviewing the folks on the street. They're saying, let them open. This is where I like going to the Burger King. I like eating there. What do you think, Sam? I think you're just so disappointed because you love Burger King. <laughs> 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 when Burger King first opened, it was probably like 30 years ago. I actually really liked it a lot because it was like th because they were char broiled hamburgers, and that was like a thing. It was never been done before. So yes, you know sometimes, and and I I know everybody out there in podcast land is the same way. You you drive past a fast food place, you're like, no, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I should. Okay, I'm gonna go, th and you go through the drive through. And oh, by the way, <laughs> they were interviewing the people in the street in Minneapolis, and I got to say this. This is important. Minneapolis gets really cold. I was yep. there once, and I was there in February, and when I got off the plane and went outside, I felt like my larynx had frozen. I couldn't even talk, it was so cold. Dry, cold air. So naturally, you probably don't wanna get out of the car when it's January and February and March in Minneapolis when you go through a drive-through. So look, banning is what you do when you are a Stalinist, in my opinion. If you're, if you're someone who wants to innovate, you're going to try something different, and that's just that's just the way the Democrat Party progressives have gone. So, Warren, you have something you want to add to this conversation before we close out. Well, I, I'm going to twist on your stupidest bill. This is the <laughs> stupidest power grab in America. Oh, I love it. I so, love it. March 13th, in the uh, this is an Illinois newspaper, or actually the Washington Examiner. Illinois mayor signs executive order granting power to ban sale of guns and alcohol while addressing coronavirus. Mayor Deborah Frank Finan signed the executive order on Thursday, declaring a state of emergency for the city. The executive order, which is in line with the municipal code, comes with extraordinary powers. So during this crisis, she can ban guns, ammunition, alcohol, and gasoline. So Why alcohol? I have no idea, but let's talk about this for a minute. And so, why gasoline? And why guns? So, yeah, so if this gets really bad and we get to what we call a state of nature... Okay, you know what a state of nature is. It's chaos. There's no government controls or anything. Yes. The only thing protecting you and your family from the wolves of the door is a firearm. That's, That's it. That is a fact. That's it. That's a fact. And so we have this idiot liberal mayor taking our right, our Second Amendment rights, our God-given right to defend ourselves. And the mayor of which city again? This is Champaign, I didn't say it, I'm sorry, Champaign, Illinois. No, that's okay, because we because we want to make sure we call them out on yes. this program, which is great. Champaign, Illinois. <laughs> Literally, basically trying to engage in a massive taking because yes. they have these extraordinary powers. Now, because now, they can. And again, like to your question, alcohol, gasoline? <laughs> Why are you going to take people's right to have gasoline? What if, what if you need a generator? What if the electrical grid's down and you need to have a generator to get electricity and heat? Or go to the hospital. Or go to the hospital. Because of the we're pandemic. Gonna ban, we're going to ban gasoline? These people are crazy. Yeah. Is, they are the party of anti-science. They are. They've become the anti-science party. I mean, and I hope at one point there's a renaissance and they finally wake up. Go ahead, Sam. I mean, are you going to ride your bike to the hospital? <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. I can't breathe. I can't pedal. You know. And I mean, pray I can't you get don't the get mugged while you're doing it. It's unbelievable. It's insane. I mean, uh, socialism is never an end goal. It's a process. You can always control more. You can always have more welfare, and it's just another example of it. And that's the last thought on 
Mark and the Millennials. <laughs> thank you for joining Mark and the Millennials. This is Mark Fisher. And I want to thank our Millennial, Sam Fisher, and our delegate, Warren Miller, from the Maryland House of Delegates. Of course, our producer, Adam Couture, and our assistant producer, Christopher Hopkins. Join us on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, and our website. See you next time. <laughs>